Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Kilrenny. This is not where you normally be on a Sunday morning, then you're especially welcome. And if this is where you always are on a Sunday morning, then you're just as welcome. So please come and join us. And join us for tea and coffee after the service. Uh, because it's lovely to always have a chat and catch up with everyone. It's good to be back. It seems like an age since I've been here. It's been four Sundays. Um, and I hope you've all benefited from the sunshine and the hot weather, but I know it's not to everybody's taste. Some people struggle with the, with the temperatures we've experienced. And as Liz and I did on our travels around uh, England in particular, it was just amazing how brown and how, how dry everything was in the farming community must really be struggling to produce the crops that we need at this time. So hopefully, let's hope and pray for just a little bit more of this kind of weather, just to give a bit of, put a bit of moisture back in the land. I've got a few intimations, so bear with me, uh, a few things to, to, to catch up with. But firstly, can I thank the worship team and Reverend Ian Witherspoon for taking the service over these past four Sundays. It's really great to be able to go away on holiday and know that you're in good hands, that, uh, that you're going to be well looked after, and I believe that all the services, I've had a quick look at them just to make sure that my hymns didn't overlap with Corinne's 20 hymns. <laughs> <laughs> she was very good this time. There's only six of them, <laughs> so it's excellent. But uh, no, it's great to be able to, to leave others to lead worship and know that that was going to be good. Um, as I do at the beginning of every month, I want to remind you about the East Duke Food Bank collection. Uh, there's a box just outside the, um, the, the washroom room here. So please, if you can contribute to that, please do so. And you know it's really tough at the moment. And every, everyone's seeing the rising price seasons and the cost of living going up, but there are some people for whom those struggles are much, much harder. So if you're able to contribute something, that would be, make a difference to somebody else. Um, you just can't believe that in this day and age, people are having to make decisions about whether they put the heating on, whether they buy food, or whether they buy clothing for their children, or themselves. And these are really difficult choices to add. You know, maybe in the past when we thought we would exaggerate things a little, but we are not now, unfortunately. So anything you can contribute would make a big difference. Uh, continuing the theme of cost of living and the cost of living crisis, some of you have seen recent publicity about the Fife Presbytery Poverty Task Force. Uh, and that's hosting a conference next Saturday at the Wellesley Centre uh, in, in uh, Metal. And the former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, and the uh, moderator of the General Assembly, Ian Greenshields, will both be speaking at that event. Now, I suspect it's already fully subscribed, but if you want details, I've got the information here with me, so if anyone wants to try and go to that, uh, just let me know. The Poverty Task Force was set up by the first moderator of the five, New Five Presbytery, uh, Jane Barham. And it's something that's really beginning to build momentum and it's partnering, partnering with a charity called the Big Hoose, uh, which is taking in lots and lots of material from Amazon and others that can be used and reused. So it's a really important aspect of the work that the new presidency is getting involved in. Um, so if you, if you would like information, even just to know how to get in touch with them, come and see me afterwards. Yesterday we hosted a meeting of the cut sessions from the three churches and guardianship uh, in this area, so uh, Kings Barnes, Lab and Ward and ourselves, as well as Karen B, who as you know, the Minister has just uh, retired, and Karen B, the new president plan, Karen B will probably split from Pitt and Wien. And I think it was a really successful meeting yesterday, I think those of us who were there uh, were encouraged by the conversations we had. What we're trying to do is not to become one big parish, 
but rather to maintain our local identities and at the same time support each other. Uh, at the moment, Callum, we are the ones probably most in need of support, but that may change in the future. Who knows what the future holds for any church? Um, but if we can start working more closely together, then that's a sign for the future and maybe something we can develop into something much bigger and more interesting as time goes by. Um, one very small aspect of that is about, is about sharing information. So this is very last minute, but I only got this yesterday lunchtime, so I can't look at something out of King's Barnes are hosting an open day, an open doors day, uh, this afternoon between 1.30 and 4.30. And as the Post of Promises, a peaceful country church, organ recitals, favourite hymns, explore the historic churchyard. We've got one of them too, but we won't, we won't get competitive. Um, and a guided walk to discover the secrets of old king's bands. Now, some of you may know those secrets already, I don't know. Anyway, if you're interested, the post I'll put this through in the church hall after the service. And you, if you're able to go along this afternoon and support them, that would be great. Like you and many of you, I was very sad to hear of the death of Christine Morris. I spoke to Tommy yesterday evening, and he was telling me how grateful he was for the support and the cards that the family had received. I'm sure you will continue to hold Tommy and his family in your thoughts and your prayers as they pray for the loss of Christine. I know she'd been a member here for many, many years and was much loved by everyone. And as I've said at the beginning, we have tea coffee after the service, so please come and join us, share your news, catch up. Have a blend. That's all we need to do. Let's come and worship the Lord. Our call to worship is taken this morning from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 5, which is part of today's legendary reading. Lord, you have seen what is in my heart. You know all about me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You know when I'm thinking, even though you are far away. You know when I go out to work and when I come back home. You know exactly how I live. Lord, even before I speak a word, you know all about it. You are all around me, behind me and in front of me. You hold me safe in your heart. Wonderful words. Amen. So let us worship our Lord in the hymn 127, or we'll worship the King all glorious of our 127.
Blessed are you, Sovereign God, Creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, and in these last days you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Lord, we come, asking for your forgiveness for all that we have done wrong, all that we have avoided doing when we knew we ought to step forward. In our weakness, we confess that we need your strength and forgiveness. Lord, as, you worship, as we worship you, we ask that you pour out your love and wisdom upon each one of us. Open our hearts to your word and your spirit, blessing each one of us with your presence in our lives. Now, Lord, we join our voices together in the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just before our next hymn, of course I forgot to welcome those who watch us online at a later point in the day or the week. So you are just as welcome to our worship as those who are here physically present with us. Let us sing again from the hymn book, number 482, Come, let us to the Lord our God, 482.
one two zero zero. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Alpha, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I will stand at my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all these holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I may appeal to you for my son, Anesimus, who became my son while I was in June. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would like to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains. But I do not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Let us sing again in the hymn book number 506. All I once held dear built my life upon 506.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Amen. Today's readings offer us a puzzle and also a challenge. So let's begin by trying to tease out the puzzle of Paul's letter to Philemon. It seems like a simple plea by Paul to his friend Philemon to treat a runaway slave uh, by the name of Onesimus. Anne and I were debating yesterday. Anne suggested we might call him Onesie. <laughs> I'm going to try very hard not to say that now. Uh, um, we're going for Onesimus, um, and hopefully my Greek is up to it. Uh, to treat this runaway slave kindly upon his return to Philemon. So far, so straightforward. However, this letter is unlike any other that we have in the New Testament. In my Bible, it's barely a page long. It doesn't want the effort of putting it into chapters, and it is by far the most personal of all the letters we have from Paul. It makes no theological, no philosophical or doctrinal points. It very much falls into the category of a letter written by one friend to another, asking a personal favour. How did it even survive to be included within our Bibles? After all, Paul must have written hundreds if not thousands of letters during his ministry. Why did this one end up in our Bibles? The context is that Paul is in prison in Rome when he writes the letter. But we shouldn't think of prison in the way we think of present-day prisons, like Berlin or Stockton. In ancient times, they tended to be more like an open prison, where those who had some means would have people around them to offer them uh, support, to bring food and clothing, and, in Paul's case, to act as a secretary. Paul rarely wrote his own letters. In fact, uh, when he makes the point in a uh, reading this morning, you can see I'm writing this by, in my own hand. That's really unusual for Paul, because Paul apparently had some visual problems and so couldn't actually write particularly well. Like many of us, if I took my glasses off, it would be childlike writing. If I tried to write with my left hand, it would be even worse. Is that so? so Paul normally had a section with him, someone to capture that. Uh, Luke was often that person uh, in, uh, in during his ministry. Men of wealth were assumed to be relatively trustworthy, so the regime was pretty relaxed in these kinds of prisons. Paul had probably been there for some time. There were plenty of people coming and going to hear him preach, to ask his advice, or to bring him correspondence from the different churches he had established or had connections with. So you can see the scene, that this is not Paul sitting shackled in some corner, scratching away on the wall, but rather something maybe comfortable, so maybe too much of a, a stretch, but certainly it wasn't as unpleasant as it might sound to our modern ears. Quite how Onesimus came to be with him is unclear. We're given to believe he's an honorary slave who had converted to Christianity, and at some point, Paul lives on this in his past, and it becomes important for him to return to his master Philemon, who holds an important position, either in the church of Laodicea or in Colossae. Both cities are close to each other, and Paul has spent a considerable amount of time in those cities. Paul and Philemon have probably worked very closely together. Most likely, Paul stayed at Philemon's house at some point, which would explain the very personal nature of this letter. Paul is writing to a close friend. And those of you who are still letter writers will know how that feels. There's things you take for granted in letters. There's speech that you use that you wouldn't use in a more formal letter. You make shortcuts because you know the other person knows this. This is very much the characteristic of this particular letter. Assuming all of that's true about Nisimus, it's very surprising that he found his way to Paul by chance, or that he could have hidden his identity for so long. He would have already known Paul from when Paul stayed with Philemon, or at least 
he would know of him. And probably Paul would have recognized him straight away. Professor Blackley, who you know, as you know, I mean, why or not, offers a different explanation to this conundrum. He suggests that Lysimus had been sent by Philemon to support Paul in his time of trouble. And that Paul was now sending Lysimus back to his master with the commendation that he be treated not as a slave, but as an individual with his own identity, deserving to become a free man and an equal within the church. In writing this letter, Paul's taking a number of risks. He was relying on the strength of his relationship with Philemon to produce the outcome he desired, the freedom of Onesimus. He was also taking the risk of sending away someone he was obviously relying heavily upon for his physical support. As Paul says, I'm an old man. He probably didn't get about very much. He certainly couldn't see particularly well. He did rely on others for support of all kinds. But a far easier thing would, be, would have been to keep an essence with him. Paul was paying a price by letting an essence go. And it's almost a wrench to let go of someone who has become important to you. All of that said, you're thinking, so what? Well, it's nice to know. Again, Professor Barker comes to us. He offers one final thought. Why is this particular letter part of our Bibles? It would appear that a number of years later, one of the uh, Ignatius, one of the great fathers of the early church, was in Ephesus and was working with a bishop of Ephesus who was collating the letters of Paul to be grouped together in some form of book, what we now know as the New Testament. That bishop happened to be called Onesimus. The coincidence is quite remarkable. It's not a name we come across very often. It sounds very much like the risk Paul took, the risk Onesimus took, and the risk that Philemon took bore great fruit. Here was someone who had started life as a slave and was now one of the great bishops of the church. Not only that, someone who has influenced the very Bible we read 2,000 years later. And in that whole thought, we can only speculate. We can't say for certain. But it does seem plausible that a personal letter concerning the individual who was then compiling the letters of Paul would slip neatly in as a message about God's love, about Paul's love, and about how risk-taking makes a difference. Let's turn to our reading from Luke. And you've heard me say before that our image of Jesus is often obscured by examples of his kindness and his healing actions. But there are times when Jesus is incredibly direct and even brutal. Listen to what he says again. Anyone who comes to me must hate their father and mother. They must hate their wife and children. They must hate their brothers and sisters. They must even hate their own life. Unless they do this, they cannot be my disciple. It doesn't get much harsher than that. <coughs> That is extraordinary. We can barely imagine these words coming from Jesus' mouth. I think this is shock value. This is about grabbing people's attention and saying to them, you know what it is? The price of being my disciple is that you will have to lift your cross and carry it with me. And you have to give up all these other things. Jesus wasn't telling people to hate those who were closest to, but he was saying the cost of following me may lead to some of these other things. You cannot follow me half-heartedly. You cannot do it in a sort of, mm, yeah, yeah, well, I'll, 
tomorrow. I'll be a disciple tomorrow. I've got a couple of hours between four and six. How's that? Jesus is saying, that's not the kind of disciple I'm after. I'm after someone who will give me everything. Even at the expense of the other things in their lives. We have to commit completely. Please don't panic. This is not going to mean the end of relationships and all the other things. But sometimes we have to think carefully about what are we committed to? Jesus goes on to use some examples of saying, you know, would you start a building without knowing you were to finish it? Unfortunately, in the 21st century, we know for any projects that never might see the end. Bad planning is never a good idea. It's difficult. This is a difficult challenge that Jesus sets us. He's saying, I don't want you just to be a Sunday morning Christian. You know, between, between quarter to ten and quarter to eleven, I'm all yours. After coffee, well, we'll see. That's not how it works. Not how it works for And I can say I'm preaching to the converted here. You know this. There is a price. It's a difficult challenge. One that will cost us far more than we can imagine to follow Jesus. But one that may lead us to places we can never imagine were possible. Just remember a man called Onesimus, who was a slave, who was constantly at the command of others, and yet one day became a bishop. Someone who we remember 2,000 years later. He could never imagine that that would be possible. And there are so many things in our lives we could never imagine could have been possible if we had not had faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Committing fully, we receive so much more, but we have to take the risk. We have to take what Kierkegaard called the leap of faith in order then to get the rewards that come with it. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these words. Let us sing again a beautiful sentiment, one that we've heard echoed already in, in our prayers and in our call to worship. Hymn 96, you are before me God, you are behind.
school and the peoples of Pakistan in your hearts. The flooding disaster they face is unimaginable, with over one third of the country underwater and millions of people homeless. It is truly shocking and dreadful to see those pictures. Let us also remember all who are struggling to make ends meet, who worry about how they will pay for food, for heating or clothing for the children, or indeed for themselves. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we bring before you our offerings of money to be blessed to do your work in this church, in this parish and in the world. As we dedicate these gifts to you, so we, may we bring ourselves and ourselves to be dedicated to your work for your people in this place. Bless us as servants, as sisters and brothers, as your friends, following whatever you need us. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for you have created us and redeemed us. You are ever ready to refresh and restore us. By you we are renewed and given the power to start again. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We come as a church broken by division and factions and seek your healing. Sometimes we have broken faith with you and with each other. We pray for all who strive to bring unity to the church. We ask your blessing upon churches that are faced with violent opposition. Lord, we come to you. Only you can make us whole. We ask that we may, made, we, we may be used as instruments of peace. We ask your blessing upon all who seek to heal the troubles between nations and peoples. We ask your blessing upon the work of the United Nations and all peacemakers. We give thanks for our homes and our loved ones. We pray for families that are suffering from broken relationships. We pray for all those with broken hopes and broken dreams. We give thanks for you are our strength and salvation. We remember all who are broken by illness. We pray for those struggling with poor mental health and all who feel their lives are on the edge of collapse. We ask your blessing upon all who are no longer able to care for themselves and those who grieve. And now in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your comfort, your compassion, and your blessing. Lord, we come to you. Only you can make us whole. Lord, you make all things new and you are the giver of life and life eternal. We ask you to bless our loved ones departed from us, that they may rejoice in the fullness of life. We commend them and ourselves to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour and Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> this month, the Church of Scotland is remembering and celebrating creation. And there will be, as I do, I will take themes from various places and I will be using the theme of creation in some of the worship we have. What more fitting way than in this particular hymn, hymn 500. Lord of creation, to you be all praise. Him finally.
heart and return to the needs of the world. May you know Christ goes before you, that there is nowhere you will be without him. May you find joy and hope as you discover that Christ is by your side. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.